All right, so now I want to talk about um, the concept of buoyancy, where it comes from, how to calculate the buoyant force, and um, the, the, key, the key thing here is something called Archimedes' principle. Um, so the, the text for Archimedes' principle goes like this. Um, a body that's immersed in a motionless fluid of uniform density experiences a vertical buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid that it displaces. Um, so I'm, I'm about to prove that to you. Um, that force acts at the center of volume of the fluid volume that is displaced. And I will show you where that comes from as well. All right, so that's the, the text is quite simple. Um, where does that come from? Well, the proof is actually not very mathematical, so um, the, it doesn't require a lot of math. So the, the idea is to do a little thought experiment. So um, let's take a little um, arbitrarily shaped boundary that we just kind of draw inside of a hydrostatic fluid. Um, so this is just sort of an imaginary boundary at this point. So we draw, draw an imaginary potato shaped object, right? It could be arbitrary. Um, if I was to think about, you know, what is the weight of the fluid that's contained inside that um, arbitrary boundary that we just drew, um, we don't really need to invoke rho g h and then do an integration of pressure around the outside. We can just look at, well, how much fluid is in there and how much gravity is acting on it. And so you can calculate that the weight of that little region that we specified, whatever its shape, is the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid times the gravitational constant, right? That's the weight of the fluid that's inside of our control volume. Well, um, in real life, that, you know, the fluid that's inside of whatever control volume I just drew is not moving, meaning that there's some pressure distribution on the outside of every imaginary boundary I can create, and whatever that pressure distribution is, it adds up in a way that the resultant force exactly counterbalances that weight. Um, so you get a resultant force that is exactly rho g times v. Um, and uh, not only that, but it has to act at the center of volume or the center of gravity of that imaginary boundary. Otherwise, it, there would be a moment. Um, and so we can place a resultant force right at the center of gravity of that um, you know, imaginary object. Well, what if it wasn't an imaginary object? Um, what if I replace it with some other object, right? So I take my imaginary boundary and in that place, I, I pluck out the fluid and I put in you know, some other object. This, whatever the other object is, it might have some different, and it usually does have a different density or a different density distribution. And so the new weight of that object might be something else and its center of gravity might be located somewhere else. But because the pressure distribution on the outside of the object has no idea what's inside the object, um, it's just doing its thing, um, the, the resultant force is exactly the same as if there was actually fluid in that locate, like the original fluid was in the, those locations. And so the resultant force due to the pressure distribution on the outside is still rho of the fluid times G times the volume of the object. And it still acts at the center of volume of that imaginary or that, that imaginary, um, uh, you know, boundary that we made. But the weight that acts now might be different. So the, the force, that, that resultant force due to the pressure distribution is called the buoyant force. And um, you know, for the reasons that I said, it always acts at the center of volume of you know, the displaced volume, and it's called the center of buoyancy. So um, how the, the center of buoyancy um, and the, the center of gravity of the object are related to one another has a lot to do with the stability um, of, you know, you know, buoyant objects, and we're going to talk about that next.